Hello, and thank you all for coming to this Monday 11.30 panel. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, we're talking today about um, unions and uh, tech. Uh, and I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Haley Tsukayama. I'm Associate Director of Legislative Activism at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a digital rights organization. And I'm going to introduce. Uh, my name is Jose. I'm uh, the community manager um, on the, uh, the activism team um, at Electronic Frontier Foundation. I work with groups in uh, with groups domestically uh, in the United States and its colonies um, on local issues and state issues um, and education and pop popular education issues um, and uh, I'm also a member of a union um, uh, that we have at uh, EFF that's right um, so I think to kick off uh, you know it's great to see you folks here it'd be great for us to get to know a little bit more about who's in the panel so that we can um, direct our information accordingly right so um, can we can we have a qu quick show of hands of uh, how many people work uh, for example as developers programmers designers um, is that we've got a few people and some people who are like kind of one one hand in uh, do we have people who do delivery uh, or any kind of transit um, work uh, or any kind of uh, people who do uh, 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 warehouse work uh, or any kind of manual labor food service workers um, okay so that gives us a little yeah uh, telco I'm not sure where that counts All right, there you go. <laughs> right Um, and then, uh, and then, lastly, I'll just say, does anybody play video games? Okay, great. All right. So just just tailoring the comments a little bit to who's in the room um, and what sectors you work in. So yeah. Um, and as a comment, guys, we're doing it. Come up to the mic so we can get recorded. Scott will. Sorry. Just on cue. Very Uh, I guess you could count it as manual labor. I'm a local stagehand uh, with IATSE Local 927, oh, hell yeah. uh, and I'm actually a union officer in my local. Oh, very cool. When a guy spits out his union number, you know. Yep. <laughs> Look, I, I'm repping the brand. Like, well, <laughs> if he does that, i got to say, of course. Uh, my name is Matt Roberts. I'm a, a job steward at Communication Workers of America, Local 3204, working for AT&T. Uh, I, I'm uh, on the leadership committee at the IFPTE. Um, it's technically the Engineers and Scientists of California, uh, Local 20 of the IFPTE, and that's um, who we got voluntary recognition um, from our management at EFF uh, even before I was on staff. Um, uh, uh, so that's that's our union. We do not yet have stewards because we're still in contract negotiations, but when we do, we will you know, transition into that structure. Yeah. Um. Uh, so, uh, just to talk a little bit about sort of stage setting, um, I think, you know, often when we're talking about workers' uh, issues at EFF, people are going, well, okay, EFF is a digital rights organization. How did you all come to this conversation? Um, and a lot of it came out of, um, so I work, for example, on general consumer data privacy legislation, and in a lot of, um, of the drafts of those bills, we started to see some really interesting um, proposals around workers' rights legislation being folded into consumer data privacy legislation. So talking about things like surveillance in the workplace, um, how that data that's gathered from, um, from uh, workplaces, from workers' um, devices, how that's being used. Um, and so they wanted to build in some protections for that. Um, and, you know, as a consumer privacy advocate, I think a lot about sort of how individuals interact with companies, how individuals interact with the government. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of frameworks in consumer data privacy that's, you know, user autonomy, user choice. Um, and so things like being able to opt in of data collection and being able to opt out of data collection. 
Of course, in the workplace context, as we started having these conversations, I realized, well, this is a very different context, right? If I opt out of getting my information collected by a company, maybe I don't get personalized ads, maybe they, maybe my service degrades. If I opt out of data collection at my workplace, um, in some of these cases, you get fired, right? Um, and that's a very different level of consequence. And so um, we've been chatting with folks um, across, so I mean, we had to get a, a little bit of education, so we had to build bridges and make some new friends in, in the labor world um, and really talk to them about what they're seeing and, and the issues that they're facing and how, um, how it makes sense for them to think about data privacy and uh, how to use that, including in collective bargaining. Um, and so a lot of that work has started, um, you know, there's been a big push um, and a lot of it has started really with um, warehouse workers uh, who work for Amazon um, a lot of the time, right? That is a very heavily surveilled workplace. Um, there are a lot of questions about, you know, how that monitoring data is used for hiring, firing, promotions, discipline. Um, and so uh, that is one area where we're seeing a lot of, of unionizing. Um, and then, of course, uh, the pandemic, when the pandemic hit in 2020, uh, a lot of the software that had already been on employee devices was deployed much more broadly or much more aggressively as people moved to remote work when they could. Um, and so we also started working on what we call bossware at EFF. Um, so uh, key loggers, uh, you know, there were some workers who said they had to have their cameras on all the time when they were working remotely. Um, and so we started talking about that. Um, and so, yeah, do you and, wanna? And then uh, in addition, we, uh, we have an Electronic Frontier Alliance, um, which is based, a, uh, it's a series of local groups across the country and the colonies, as I was mentioning earlier, um, that work on all sorts of issues. It could be, you know, broadband access, it could be uh, law enforcement surveillance or workplace surveillance issues, um, and it could be, you know, a, a myriad of other issues as well. Um, but a number of them are, uh, uh, groups, collectives um, of tech workers, designers, programmers, and developers as well. And so, you know, they bring some of their issues to us. We, you know, we kind of learn about them um, and work with them. I'll be honest, obviously, some of us uh, who are working on this in EFF already had kind of labor interests before we came in. Some of us had already been members before we came to EFF and either joined the organizing effort or uh, just joined the union once, uh, once the union was already in um, in so um, so some of it was some of it was that uh, and I'll talk a little bit maybe at some point about some of the kinds of groups that have joined and affiliated with uh, the Electronic Frontier Alliance that are made up of those kinds of workers but the other side of it is um, which brings it uh, largely back to what Haley was just talking about um, is that what do we mean by tech workers uh, and a p big part of that kind of question is that it's very easy to kind of uh, it, it may or may not be easy to kind of relegate it to people who are programmers, developers, and designers um, on computers, but that's not how the industries are defining it. That's not how management is defining it. That's not how sometimes some of the regulators are defining it because people who are drivers, people who are delivery people, people who work in warehouses are increasingly being categorized in other ways, including as some, you know, some form of tech workers because the products are sold on an app you know, because the delivery is, is requested on an app. These are the same kinds of jobs as in the past, mm -hmm. and management um, in these sectors are often engaging in the same kind of attempts to redefine the, work, the, the, the job so that they can get around labor regulations um, and potentially get around the National Labor Relations Act in some cases. But, you know, they are nevertheless, you know, part of the tech sector. Um, and, and I think also, I think people in the entertainment uh, industry clearly in many cases are also part of the tech sector uh, as well. So uh, when, when we do say tech sector, because I think it's um, the name of the, uh, the panel is the rise of labor unions and technology shops, you know, it's, it is a little bit more ephemeral. I think a lot of what, what I'm prepared to talk about is kind of on the, the design and programmer side. Um, even though I'm not one and uh, I'm a complete layperson when it comes to computers, um, but, uh, but we also, you know, we also work with and are thinking about, uh, as Haley was saying, warehouse workers, drivers, uh, uh, food service workers, and basically everybody else. Um, because 95% of us are working class uh, and tech is affecting, you know, most jobs, almost all jobs at this point. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point, right, when we're talking about what is defined as the tech industry. I mean, you know, labor unions have existed in the, in, in the core tech industry for a while, right, in the, in the 70s and 80s with semiconductor 
manufacturers and stuff like that. But we've really seen a, a, a new rise in the past few years, um, in many ways triggered by the pandemic, and then also triggered by the fact that uh, tech is now pervasive in so many parts of our, our lives, and a lot of the companies that are coming up are being treated as tech companies, or they're using technologies, um, and so it's, it's a much broader a much broader swath and also the tech industry has been pr uh, particularly hostile to unionization in the past um you know i think it's a very startup culture right they want as little they say they want as little bureaucracy as possible they say it's a third party coming in and preventing them from innovating quickly the usual union busting <laughs> talking points <laughs> right you notice i'm couching it they say this um uh and so um it has been a, a a sector that's been a little more difficult to unionize, but um, I do think as we're seeing both the expansion of it to different types of, of um, industries that had not been um, labeled, as such, right. labeled as tech before, um, and then of course the pandemic has has triggered a lot of things. Right. And, and, and in addition, you know, I mean, unions were trying to break into, for example, I, you know, I'm I'm thinking in terms of entertainment in part because we're at Dragon Con and I've been looking for all my favorite intellectual property characters, so like. Um, you know, a, a, a big part of it is this kind of idea that this is a labor of love. People go into these industries because they really love it. This is something that they, you know, they're excited about, you know, uh, participating in the, the, the games and the, and the movies and the TV shows and the theater. Um, and, uh, and therefore, they should just, you know, suck it up and, and uh, be exploited worse than other workers. And that's just not the case, I think, hopefully, uh, if... if there's any dissension in the room, we can maybe open you up to uh, to, to thinking of things um, in a more open way. And if there's not, then you know maybe we can hear uh, at some point some of y'all's perspectives as well. Um, but you know we'll we'll get into some of that kind of stuff as well. But I think. Um, you know, a decent amount of what I'm thinking about um, up here is white collar, and we can certainly go blue collar and pink collar and and, uh, and every other collar as well if, if people want to. So. Yeah. Do you want to move on? Um, so uh, uh, I could start with I'll start with a little bit uh, the the entertain some of the the entertainment industry. Um, so. Uh, you know, how is it going is one of the kind of questions that we were um, wondering, and, and why are people um, organizing? Um, and in the entertainment industry, there's a whole lot of reasons, uh, just like everywhere else. But of course, you know, there's this sale, there's this sales pitch that you're in it because you love it, right? That it is, that you're, it's the dream job. Now, all these people love video games and they get to actually go uh, make video games. All these people loved movies, now they get to make movies. Um, but it's burning people out, you know? The, the, a big, big part of the reason that, um, that things have moved uh, is even before the pandemic, the workflow and workload issues. So there's, uh, we could talk a little bit about things like crunch time, we could talk a little bit about game jams, um, but there are uh, a series of different industries where they engage in, uh, they have deadlines based on when the movie or a TV show or a video game is supposed to come out. And they work into the to the thinking of when they're going to have that deadline that they're going to force the workers uh, within for for the last few weeks or the last few months to be working 60, 80, or even more uh, even longer hour work weeks without being paid overtime. So they're still getting paid the same thing that they were getting paid before, but now they are in the last few weeks or months um, getting uh, getting uh, overloaded with with double the, the amount of workload. Um, and uh, some of this kind of came to a head with EA Sports uh, 20 years ago um, in what was called the EA Spouse Blog. Uh, and it was a, a spouse of a, a developer who started blogging about the fact that the, this was causing problems in people's marriages. It was causing problems in people's um, personal lives. These people, the, the workers themselves were being burned out. And it wasn't being talked about anywhere. Um, it was just being expected that if you work on uh, video games, at the, at the end, you're going to be uh, working 80-hour work weeks with no extra pay, um, and your family is going to just have to be subjected to that. So uh, EA Sport, you know, there was a bit of a controversy around it, and EA Sports, um, you know, kind of dialed it back at the time, but as uh, employers often do, things are often dialed back temporarily until the media coverage um, and the organizing drives are over, and then things start to move back. And uh, crunch time has continued to be, in the last 20 years, something that uh, workers have complained about um, across, uh, you know, video effects voice effects and audio effects industries uh, as well as uh, as well as in video games 
Um, and uh, at the same time, there has been a very hostile work environment, especially around sexual discrimination, gender-based discrimination. And so there were a series of walkouts and actions in the 2000 teens around that in a lot of um, in a lot of uh, a lot of the big kind of uh, tech companies and entertainment companies, um, you know, some of the notable ones, you know, like Activision um, and Blizzard, there had been, you know, lawsuits in some cases, and in other cases, there had been large number of numbers of workers who either tried to do car check agreements or did walkouts um, in opposition to uh, what they said was terrible sex and gender discrimination in the workplace, including harassment. So, uh, so you know, when people were thinking about what they can do to deal with that, Unions became an idea, you know, a, a big part of that conversation. And so, in 2014 and 2018, there were uh, big periods of these kinds of walkouts. And I think a lot of these workers started to organize on Slack, on Discord, and um, and other social media because in, even before the pandemic, they weren't always in the same workplace. Uh, and you know, they got to the agreement that they would try to organize uh, organize unions. Um, of course. The arguments that we that we've heard are generally very similar arguments we hear in a lot of other industries, um, which is that if you love it, then why would you bring someone else to come in? Uh, and the truth is that it, you know, if you love it, you don't want to burn out, right? That's a big part of it. It was it, some you don't if you love it, you don't want to create you don't want to be working in a hostile work environment where other workers who are coming in, um, who are young, who are newer, uh, are are immediately scared off, discriminated against, and pushed out. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, there were massive wage disparities, and there was a lot of wage and uh, benefit inconsistencies based on projects. So uh, last year, uh, the last year, um, one of the the big uh, video effects um, attempts to, to organize uh, that was uh, connected with, uh, I think it was connected with uh, IATSE, um, put out a report where they surveyed workers across the video effects. Uh, uh, you know, world landscape, and they found that you know most of them were not getting uh, overtime uh, to the tune of about 58 percent, I think, um, of of those that were in uh, working for the studios. Um, you know, huge numbers of them were not getting health care outside of the projects. You do, you got health insurance only when you were working on a project, and then the the, the health insurance was pulled. Um, you know, so these kinds of inconsistencies, people can't live that way, right? Like we all have health care costs. This is a we have a we have a private health care system in this country, and it is supposed to be employer based for the most part, right? And in a lot of states, they want to make sure that it's employer based, that you can't get the that uh, uh, a consistent public health care option. So you know, you have to go through the employer, and if the employer is only giving you health insurance while you're working, and then when you're all when you're on layoff or you're off project, you don't have that health insurance. Your body doesn't, you know, stick up with, uh, you know, it doesn't just, yeah. you know, calm down and everything suddenly functions properly. So, um, so in order to create these kinds of consistent health insurance policies and health care coverages, in, in order to keep the wages coming in uh, and make sure that people were, were, were getting overtime, um, a lot of these workers in the last four or five years, even before, just before the pandemic, had started moving towards unions. Um, and I think that those are some of the reasons, but I would also like, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll jump into Q&A you know, in 15 or so minutes or 10 minutes. Pretty. And then, yeah. um, and then we can hear from some of y'all what maybe reasons in your industry or in your sector yeah. that you might be organizing or thinking about it. Yeah, I do want to pick up on your point about consistency, though, because I think um, there are a couple of issues to think about. Well, there are many issues to think about, but um, thinking about consistency, I mean, I think for one, Often tech companies like to think themselves think of themselves as the purest form of a meritocracy, and I think we have seen over the past several decades that as that workforce has developed, there are disparities, and there are. Um, that's why it's really important for solidarity across the company right. um, to make sure that everybody at your, your workplace is um, is being treated the same, is being treated equally, and is getting the support they need. Um, great point. Another kind of interesting thing about the tech sector is that it is very heavily. Um, there's a heavy representation of contractors, and contractors is it, it that is an issue that is very um, is very difficult. I think for unions to to work with um, the way that the Alphabet Workers Union, for example, um, has done so. Alphabet, Google, Google, um, <laughs> uh, uh, they are um, what's called a solidarity union or a minority union. So they're not registered. They're not a, an, L, an LRB registered union, but they um, so they can't engage in collective bargaining. But they also do 
represent the, the interests of their contractors. And so there are a couple of different ways that people have come at this um, in the, you know, just based on the way that, that um, the tech industry is structured. And, and you're still, even in a minority union, even without a union, you still have National Labor Relations Act protections Absolutely. for concerted activity. So for example, if you don't have a union or if you have a minority union and there is gender-based discrimination or there is, uh, you know, there, there are wage issues and there's wage theft, workers can and are protected officially uh, to, to engage in some level of, of meeting and having a conversation about it and then uh, going out and doing an action or taking it to a labor lawyer or a union that may have a labor lawyer on staff that can, um, that can help out in that kind of way. Um, however, uh, you know, that is very difficult for a lot of workers to do because in especially the entertainment uh, and news um, as, as Haley knows, uh, and other fields that are often thought of as kind of like the central tech ones, the, the, uh, the truth is there are massive layoffs, right? Private, ec private equity firms buy up, uh, buy up um, news agencies, online news agencies, and then lay everybody off, close them, or, or close sectors. In other cases, you might have Netflix, which may say that it's going to do a huge amount of investment in some kind, in, in you know, uh, DEI style entertainment, um, looking at where the market shares are. There's lots and lots of, you know, people who are really, really ready and willing to watch a lot of stuff that hadn't been watched before. And Netflix was like, well, we're going to put money into it. And also everybody look at us putting money into it. And then, you know, in some cases before the projects even got off the ground, the money was pulled and everybody was laid off after, you know, Netflix got to look really good for, uh, for its diversity, equity, and inclusion um, programming. So, uh, but, uh, and I just want to jump one, one, on one last thing. I think uh, if there are people who think of yourselves as professionals, uh, as people who are developers, designers, and programmers, um, in some cases, including in the case of Alphabet and including in the case of Amazon, uh, some of the workers who have been, uh, who are professionals in that field who have been organizing have been doing so in solidarity with the warehouse workers or with the, 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 the techs who are on the, on the field. And so that kind of organizing is really, really much more effective because you have to have people who are doing the warehouse work. You have to have the delivery drivers. The rest of you may be laid off, but the, the warehouse workers, even if they get laid off, they're still going to have warehouses. And if they, uh, if they cut those warehouses, they're, they're simply going to have a contract with another, um, with a private offsite warehouse. Uh, so you really, you know, you're, you stand to benefit by being in solidarity with the, all the other workers who are working, even including the clerical staff, housekeeping. I've been a housekeeper in a, uh, in a healthcare union before, for example. Um, so, you know, I, I would, I just wanted to piggyback on that particular point in, in particular. Yeah, and I would say too, I would point out, the Washington Post did a, a good article. Jose, I used to be a Washington Post reporter, that's why he referenced uh, news media. But the um, Washington Post had a good article in uh, April 21, just saying like, you know, not, if you're looking at layoffs at the, at the at tech companies, you're also often looking at layoffs of people like janitorial staff right. or cafeteria staff. Right. Um, and so even within thinking about tech workers, you know, right. there are def obviously other people who work um, at those companies. Um, I did want to just, well, oh, go ahead. So really quickly, that, that reminded me that also some of, the, um, some of the designers and programmers that couldn't get a majority union, one of the things that they did was they turned around and supported their cafeteria staff um, in joining Unite Here, uh, which is usually kind of a, a, a food service and um, hospitality service union. Uh, so that's another thing that, that, that even if you can't get a majority in a card check agreement, even if you can't get a majority in a voter, you can't, um, you can't get to a vote for a union in your own sector in the in the uh, in the company, you know some some workers have decided that they're going to be in solidarity with the other staff um, who are often considered less professional. But let's be real; these are all professions, and everybody's also replaceable. Um, so because everyone's replaceable, everybody deserves a union, and you know you you work together, you, you're going to keep your job. So. Um, I do want to just bring it back briefly to talk about, um, you know, because we are on the Electronic Frontiers uh, track, um, you know, I talked a little bit about data surveillance and data privacy and how that intersects with workers, workers um, uh, 
the conversation around workers. Um, I think increasingly when we're talking about tech policy, we do have to talk about labor interests, um, you know, particularly around um, AI, which I think right. is maybe something you want to talk about, right? AI policy is a very hot topic right now. Um, and in many ways, if you're thinking about, okay, what does algorithmic management look like? What does um, what is data-driven management look like? Um, in a lot of cases, you do have to think about, okay, what, how, what effect does that have on workers, right? If it's algorithmic hiring, firing, again, discipline, right. Right. Um, you know, sort of what rights do workers have? What rights do workers want to advocate for um, in knowing more about sort of how those technologies work, how they're deployed in their own workplaces, um, how to appeal decisions that may be made. Um, and so, you know, there's actually a, a lot of work being done right now. Um, I, so I do legislative work, uh, and in California a couple of years ago, we advanced, a, we supported a bill that was a digital workers' rights bill that was a uh, advanced by the California Lab Labor Federation. Um, and that was like sort of, it didn't get very far, unfortunately, but um, that was a bill that really kind of laid out like what are the transparency requirements that these companies should have if they're gonna, um, if what kind of notice do they have to give, um, sort of what kind of processes are in place. And so in that way, the digital rights, you know, it's the data privacy, it's the AI, um, it's all that, uh, they all come together. Right, and, and you know, uh, a little bit to what Haley's speaking to is, it, you know, we we're thinking about ChatGPT sometimes in replacing, you know, jobs, like replacing programmers or replacing creatives. But the truth is that it's also being used in management, and it's being used to decide who gets hired, uh, if there are disciplinary hearings and, or disciplinary action, um, and who gets fired. And far be it from me to ever be a proponent of the federal government. But the, uh, there are a few federal agencies that are thinking about this now. The Department of Labor, the National Labor Relations Board, um, the Department of Justice's uh, uh, Labor Office have all put out uh, some new new statements and plans to, to create guidelines and rules and to enforce the existing rules on these kinds of questions. Um, and so if you feel like there is algorithmic decision making in your workplace, uh, in a hiring process that may, be, that may end up being discriminatory, um, it's worth looking into what, uh, what the EEOC, the Department of Labor, the NLRB are thinking about in that direction. Um, because it is going to be some level of protection, uh, even though there are, there's some legislation in Congress, it's not going to get passed anytime soon, uh, if ever. So, you know, we have to sometimes use the, the tools that we have. Um, and some of that is direct action through minority unionism, some of that is collective bargaining through majority unionism, and some of that uh, may be going to regulators at the federal or state level or municipal level, um, calling out uh, uh, either algorithmic decision making, discrimination in the workplace, or, or uh, general social control through tech. Um, when they when they surveil us in the workplace to a certain extent, we can't, as Haley was saying, we can't say no to it because we can lose our jobs. We are at will employees in most of the country, um, and uh, and when you don't have a union, um, but. Uh, but you can start to push back, and some of the, the legislation uh, and some of the executive orders that uh, that have been coming out are, in theory, to increase transparency and some level of pushback, allow uh, workers to actually have some control over the data that's collected on them by their employers and to be able to contest it. Um, and that's kind of one of the directions that we're looking, uh, in some cases, for state legislation to also go in the direction of. So. Yeah. All right, I will admit I have spoken far more than I intended to. I definitely want to hear from this panel, especially um, since you came out on a Monday to, to talk to us. So um, if you have a question, please approach the mic. You know, and, and we'd also like to hear from people from different sectors uh, about what's going on in your, in your sector, your workplace, if you're willing to talk about it. Um, it is being recorded. So. Yeah, that's a good, good point. You're probably aware of the situation with Twitter when Elon Musk took it over and fired a lot of, you know, workers. It's probably created a lot of, in people's minds, the need for a union if right. their company doesn't already um, belong to one or the workers don't belong to one. Uh, what are your views on the way that these workers were mistreated? S some, you know, with no notice or very little notice or, right. you know, severance packages, that sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, have a, I have a few things yeah, to say on that. We can go back and forth a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, part of it is that there's a little bit of a, <clears throat> a chicken and the egg thing. Whenever workers start to talk about organizing, one of the biggest forms of retaliation is the idea that they can lose their jobs. Now, if it's, if it's directed, 
you know, if it's uh, focused on workers who are engaging in concerted activity, that is technically illegal, and workers who are not organized can still engage in a, in a lawsuit for back pay and or their job back. And it, people win. Um, so if that ever happens to you, I, I uh, think that you should try, you should look into it, you should investigate if there are any kind of labor uh, or uh, labor law groups um, in your city, in your, in your area. Um, but the truth is that a lot of workers came to wanting a union because of the massive layoffs that are so often happening in every sector, right? It's, it's hospitality sectors, it's, uh, it's tech sectors, um, it's warehouse workers, it's factory workers. Um, in every sector, there's massive job layoffs. And uh, some of the stuff that some of the tech worker groups have in particular thought about and some of the journalist groups have also thought, of, uh, worker groups have also thought about is, um, where do we, how do we preserve our jobs? One way, obviously, you try to organize a union in, you know, in a, on occasion, uh, the employers may lay everyone off and, uh, and, you know, you've lost your jobs and you've lost your union. They were going to do it anyway. That's the, that's the spoiler alert. But the other side of things is that there are journalists, for example, in New York that used to work for the Village Voice, for the Gothamist, for, uh, for a number of other publications that engaged in widespread layoffs. And their response was to create a couple of cooperatives. They created journalist cooperatives that now work as wire services. They're still investigative journalists. They're still um, publishing online. And some of, those, uh, some of that stuff is still going into larger publications. But now they, they run their business collectively. Um, they are also they have a union, uh, you know, f at least to be in solidarity with workers who still have management. Um, and the same thing is happening in the video game sector. Uh, uh, there are attempts by uh, a lot of the video game um, union uh, 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 efforts to also kind of educate workers on how to qu create cooperatives, so that uh, if you're engaging in you know indie video game making or you want to um, or you get laid off, that's another direction that you can go. You can have uh, uh, a bunch of workers who've been laid off who have skills, know how the workflow functions, uh, get together and create your own business where everybody is a collective owner and uh, everybody is a manager. I was in a workers' cooperative once upon a time. We were also in the printers' union um, because we didn't believe in uh, separating ourselves out from, from the rest of uh, the workforce. Um, and so that, that also kind of sometimes becomes an option. Um, and it can become an option on a wide scale. There are you know, workers' cooperatives in the world that have thousands of workers. Uh, but obviously, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, the tech sector, it works in the United States, and it's functioning mostly in smaller um, indie uh, cooperatives um, that function. So yeah. that's one option. Yeah. Please. Um, hello, my name is Eliza Schultz. Um, I'm in Teamster 705. I'm a UPS package car driver. So I have, um, I guess I have some kind of thoughts from, from that angle, you know, from my, from my workplace and yeah. the kind of issues that we've been dealing with. And I think, um, you know, the comments you made about uh, what's going on with Amazon and other warehouses are important for us to look at. So um, I guess there's, there's kind of a couple different things. Um, you know, one thing is the, uh, like the surveillance, you know, kind of angle. So, you know, everything, um, you know, even in my job with union protections, you know, everything is tracked and monitored by telematics, you know, yeah. um, ev you know, my GPS location at all times, how many seconds I have my door open, you know, you know, whatever, all of this is monitored and management as a printout. You know, every activity you does has a time value, you know, of like how many seconds it should take you to like walk from one point to another or open a door or ring a doorbell, you know, or whatever. Um, and so that's like, that's one thing, you know, um, you know, I see, I understand that in Amazon management has, you know, that algorithmic, you know, uh, you know, control to operate on it. You know, it's something that, you know, we have, I think, successfully fought, you know, to some degree in, in use, you know, with, with our contract. Mm -hmm. The biggest fight recently um, was just uh, putting cameras, right, in, in driver facing cameras. And so that's something where we've mostly, um, our contract says that the cameras have to be disabled, and I have no idea, you know, how uh, how effective or you know what's going to happen there. Like, what stops them from just turning them on and, and using them? But we're seeing that, um, and so I guess, um, and then also just 
I think there's a whole conversation about automation. So, so more and more, it's been pretty slow, I think, in the warehouse industry. Most tech is actually very, very old, but automation is slowly seeping in. I think that's a question of you know who has power as you remove more workers out of the equation. It is um, reducing also gigification. You know, new technology has opened up like gigification. Mm -hmm. You know, of, of of deliveries, which is which is happening at UPS now. Although I think Amazon is really at the forefront of it. Um, so that's like a couple things I guess I say. Um, my boyfriend is um, the software engineer at Google, so I also see some of that angles, you know, the, the layoffs. And um, I kind of, a, so I kind of have a question, I guess two questions. I want to hear what you think about, you know, where we are in this fight against surveillance, you know, on the job in these warehouse industries, what you know. And then on the, you know, with the software engineers and those who are working in technology firms, I mean, what does organizing look like you know, in this town time where most people are working remote, and I mean, we all know that like relationships at the workplace are not as you know tight or as developed as you know they might have been in a previous period, and that poses challenges to organizing. Before so. before you get uh, sit back down, um, are you allowed to obstruct the cameras? Um, and if so, <laughs> why don't why don't the if they're supposed to turn the cameras off, just why don't yeah, why isn't so you the can, union, for example, give everybody a little dashboard, you know, uh, <laughs> toy that can just obstruct the cameras? Yeah. So I think um, the I actually haven't seen the cameras have not hit my um, my my warehouse at all. So I've only heard about them from others. Um, how the cameras are currently working is. Um, they're not using them right now for like recording video. They're 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 more telematic sensors, and so what they've been doing is they they, they ping you when you're like doing distracted driving, according to the the system, and then it like adds it to account. Um, and so, like, I've heard you know people like they reach for like their water bottle or whatever to like take like a drink, and so it, like it pings them and it like increases their count, you know, and that's how it's been worked been working and I'm not actually sure if they can still use that capability or not as long as they are promising that it's not like recording like video mm -hmm. so that's I don't know that's um that's kind of I, I haven't seen it though I haven't seen it personally yeah um, I, I think one of the uh, part of it is that you know, blessed to the Teamsters and to UFCW as well, um, that have been trying to figure out how to organize uh, uh, app-based delivery drivers, um, as well as uh, Warehouse Workers for Justice and Warehouse Workers United, and a number of other attempts. By some of them are by uh, already existing unions um, and. Uh, the like to try to figure out how to organize warehouse workers who are in the app-based economy. Um, and I think one of the things that's like fascinating to me is they spent a lot of time telling us, and 10 years ago it was very easy to hear them say, well, unions are uh, yesterday's news. It's a thing for something. It was a thing in the 50s, but it's not a thing anymore. And now the sector is, our, our sector is too advanced, too innovative, too dynamic. Things are changing. But the truth is that French workers were occupying factories in the 60s over the exact same stuff that was like, you know, timing how long they were on task, timing how long they, it took them to get to the bathroom, uh, you know, and requ often required workers to then stay in their post pee in a bottle, stay put, because they could lose wages just for going to the bathroom. So that, it isn't new, right? It's something that they want to pretend is new because they want to say, well, it's a, it, tech is always moving, tech is always advancing, and you know, there's a lot of innovators, so uh, things have changed. But it's really, you know, they may be using new kinds of technology to surveil us uh, on, in the workplace, but the truth is that the, the social control was always there, and workers have been pushing back on it for decades. Yeah. Uh, to get specifically at your question about sort of where, like, legislatively, for example, we are. Um, so there are a couple of really ambitious bills that haven't gotten very far, but I think um, advocacy is often a, a very long process, right? You're doing a lot of education, you're talking to folks, you're building allies over the years. There have been a couple of... Um, it's not exactly the same kind of thing, but there, there have been a couple of... There's one in, in California that looks at... Um, you know, banning quotas in, in warehouse work. So, um, you know, based, a lot of those quotas are based on some of the stuff that you're talking about, right, where it's timing how long it should take you to do X or Y or Z. And time, time off task. Time off task, okay. right. Um, and so uh, 
there has been some some success. I think we've we've seen that pop up in a couple of states, um, and so there is definitely a lot more attention being paid to it. But I think the the um, the policy conversation is a little behind, as as can often happen, right? Um, what we're seeing, and so um, that's why I think it's really interesting to kind of see the, the unionization effort happening at the same time as the policy effort, and really just trying to figure out how to how to make those work together. The the, the legal issue, you know, the legislative issue also runs into a problem because there's constantly attempts to create exemptions. Um, you know, how many delivery drivers, how many uh, uh, car rideshare uh, drivers are called small business owners at this point because they own a car? They they can be fired, right? They can they can be hired, they can be fired, they can be disciplined, they have managers, but they're being called small business owners, and as such, this is an attempt by Uber, Lyft, and, and other uh, companies to get around those kinds of protections. Um, and I think, you know, if you have a union, one of the other best places is obviously collective bargaining agreements, because if, uh, if we can't get legislation passed in a lot of states, um, even if we can get it passed in some states, but we can't uh, get it everywhere because they're opening the warehouse the warehouses for Amazon, for example, are everywhere, right? They're in every part of the country. So um, that includes right to organize states and so-called right to work states. That includes places where it's much easier for for, uh, for, for management to bust up unions. So, um, you know, I would point also to CWA. CWA has a good, uh, a good uh, website that's specifically about how to think about tech and surveillance in the contract. Um, and we're also thinking about it right now because we have contract negotiations um, at EFF. And so we're trying to like some of some of our you know uh, team is, is thinking about how to do uh, how to include that kind of stuff because it also will be helpful for us in a policy conversation later on when we're talking to other kinds of workers or we're talking to legislators and regulators yeah um, there is also a, I should have said this earlier too there's also a put you know, and when you're negotiating a contract there's some things that are called mandatory subjects of bargaining and there's some things that are kind of more elective so there is a push from many um, of the larger national unions to say okay well can we make things like data use surveillance collection a mandatory subject of bargaining so that if you're going to put it in your workplace you and you have a union that's something that you have to talk about um, and at minimum, again, it's, it's this question of like, workers should know all the data collected on them. They should be able to have that data deleted, especially if they leave their, their, uh, their position, because otherwise management now is just collecting data on, on past workers, may lay somebody off, but, but can profit off of all of that data. And they should be able to contest it, especially if there are algorithmic management uh, uh, decision making that may, uh, you know, uh, reduce their work, um, their their working hours, or otherwise uh, discipline them. Mr. Roberts. Hey, yes. Um, <clears throat> once again, Matt Roberts, CWA 3204, and that's a cwa-code.org if you're looking at that website. Uh, find me after if you need me. Uh, but the question I have is, so we had, we personally have had, and I'm not sure if I can share the company, a large tech company where we had an 80% card check, and it took the company two weeks to bust us before we could have an election. With us having certainly the most pro-union president we've had in my lifetime, um, is there any chance that card check will ever happen on a national level as a union organizing, as opposed to giving them the opportunity to like AFCO? To, yeah, yeah, giving them the opportunity to find out where the election is and put cameras around the boxes like they did at Amazon and bust it before we can do anything. That's so out of my will. <laughs> I, I, I will say, I would say, you know, when I mean, you know. The, the, there was a period uh, 15, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, where people were really thinking that EFCA was, I think maybe you're talking about EFCA. Like, I believe, um, yeah. So, I was not union at the time. I remember right. hearing about it. I wasn't really union at the time. So, can so, can so, you tell me what that acronym stands for? I, I can't, I okay. can't <laughs> tell you exactly what it stands for. But basically the idea is that um, the National Labor uh, Relations Board, uh, you, you could probably explain this stuff better than me, but, um, you know, you can have a vote. Right, and it is an anonymous vote where, uh, where as you know, as many workers as want to can vote up or down on the union. Um, but there is tremendous amount of union busting uh, in those in those uh, efforts. And so one of the things that the labor movement tried to figure out was how to get more card check agreements and how to get a basically majority card check. If you have a majority of a uh, of a workforce voluntarily affiliating with a union, then that should be enough. And uh, and 
you know, that legislation, a lot of people thought that was going to get passed 15 years ago. And uh, there was, uh, you know, Democratic super, you know, not super majorities, but there were Democratic majorities um, at multiple levels of government and, it, and nothing came to pass. Um, you can't rely on Republicans or Democrats to, to, to pass this stuff for us. Um, you know, so, you know, I think it's worth it to continue to fight for that. And I think at the state level, in some parts of the country, you know, people, you know, that still does function and people are still able to organize. But it's also sometimes, you know, a, a good road in for for minority unionism at minimum. To um, and minority unionism, you know, at minimum, kind of shows other members uh, or other workers who may not join the union that there is a benefit to to being able to negotiate because as the wages go up for the people who've uh, agreed to join the union, they go up for everybody else too. And of course, the employer doesn't want people to join the union, so they're happy to make sure that everybody gets the pay increase, including the non-union workers or that everybody gets, you know, the, the increased health care or PTO, um, not just the unionized workers. So I think, you know, card, card you know, uh, 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 signing at least for minority unionism and, and for example, uh, right to be disorganized states is also um, a possibility. Yeah. I'm just going to note we are over time, but I'm, I know there are still some questions, so no one's waving me off. So we'll no, try and keep our yeah, answers brief. Oh, we have 15 more, oh, 50 more minutes? Oh, yeah, yeah. it's 12 I thought 11. I'm sorry. Keep, keep going. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, so I'm a software engineer, so I've worked in a typical like Silicon Valley late stage startup and sort of can speak to a lot of people on that. And mm -hmm. I feel like the biggest barrier for a lot of people entering isn't necessarily like pessimism, but maybe an abundance of optimism. Uh, so most of us have joined the workforce like post 2008, especially post dot com bubble. Mm -hmm. So even with like the recent layoffs of the last year or so, there's still more people in our position than there were like pre-COVID. So there's been like a decade of like a lot of people seeing like really fast promotions and seeing very little firings or other like negative actions. Mm -hmm. So, and there's also a perception maybe unfair that like all promotions in like a union workforce is based on seniority versus like, mm -hmm some other kind of form of merit, mm -hmm. however a company may define or not define merit. I'm just a bit curious what kind of things you'd say to people like that or try to convince them that like a union isn't just something they should do like for the workforce as a whole, but why it's actually good for them. Right. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, among other things, you know, any union is made up of, of the, the membership and the membership is not on one side of the political fence or another, right? Mm -hmm. So in our workplace and in many uh, tech workplaces, there are libertarians, Trumpers, Democrats, socialists, it doesn't matter your politics. Um, if you see favoritism and you see cronyism in the workplace, uh, you know, you want to have some level of accountability and some level of, of consistency of benefits and wage um, wages. So uh, I would say that's a big part of it, right? And I think that part of it is also when you're doing an organizing drive, be very careful about the culture, right? You have to make sure that it's a healthy and a positive culture for the rank and file because it's very easy if you have a few uh, a few members uh, of the, the workforce who would be in the bargaining unit who think of themselves as professionals or think of themselves as um, in a dream job uh, to kind of throw a wrench in it the moment that uh, people are too combative or, uh, you know, hostile or kind of gatekeep or anything like that. It's it's about all of the workers. It doesn't matter their politics. It doesn't matter their profession or anything else like that. If they're in the bargaining unit, if they're not in management, um, they stand to benefit. And a big part of that is to prevent discrimination and to, discrim to, to prevent favoritism. So if they ever had a manager that they ever was were a little frustrated about, um, or if there's a changeover in their department, or if they're looking at another department and their department's great, and there's, you know, and, and they have a decent manager, but another department has some kind of abuse or there is uh, there's burnout then you know some level of stability and consistency uh, through a through a, a collective bargaining agreement I think is uh, something that even helps the the most libertarian most professionalized workers among us and the truth is that you know professional whether you have a college degree whether you have a grad degree whether you have you whether you're an RN whatever you are uh, you can always be proletarianized you can always be brought back down to being um, a worker who is replaceable uh, in this economy so you know a lot of workers will not think that they need a union until they uh, until they uh, suddenly do and it's in some cases uh, when it's when it's a question of layoffs and the like it's too late so you know try to get them before it's too late as well and I think what 
you know, what has seemed to be effective at a lot of places, right, is also just talking about, um, you know, um, especially in the tech sector, like you, it is a it is an industry that is built on fast growth and fast change. Um, you know, if you're talking about job security, those you know those things can change very quickly, and so it's really about kind of having a voice. I think that's been a, a particularly um, compelling argument that we've seen come out of a lot of these companies. Um, and I, um, yeah. Sorry, I lost my second. Yeah, I mean, if, the if, second if, track of my train of thought. If we're a big proponent of small d democracy, right? Then, um, you know, why do we put up with a dictatorship in our workplace? Um, oh, I know what the other point is. It's, it's uh, strong for you. Uh, collective bargaining agreements, of course, are also, you know, negotiated between a unit and the management. So just because if it's, you know, at my last yeah. union, it was like this, um, you know, it really is a way for, for workers. I think what's been effective in the, in the messaging, right, is to say it's a way for workers to dictate what should be at their workplace, right? You, mm -hmm. It's not a cookie cutter agreement at, across the board. There are obviously some things that are legally required, but um, you can really kind of talk about you can make it unique to your workplace, and, and and it can be a it can be a healthy place for um, if management and the the bargaining unit are uh, you know see eye to eye on a lot of mission things or on a lot of the passion of it and stuff, then it's just a place for people for them to discuss together um, and make some decisions together. Management's still going to be management, right? Like you're not turning it into a workers' cooperative by bringing in a union, but you're simply creating some level of voice for for the bargaining unit um, to 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 play a role and then you know management now has guidelines and there is some level of consistency based on a contract um, and can't just engage in arbitrary decision making in that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I actually have some important and great news to share on the card check front. Uh, as of I believe last week the NLRB has changed the uh, basically the order of operations when it comes to organizing. Mm -hmm. uh, previously you would have to perform a card check go to the employer and say, hey, we've done a card check. Would you like to voluntarily recognize us? Lol, no. Uh, <laughs> then the union has to go to the NLRB and ask them for an election. Right. Election get, date gets set, yada, 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 union busting happens. Now the NLRB has said that not only is voluntary recognition the de facto status, mm -hmm. you perform a card check, you go to the NLRB and say, hey, we've performed a card check. We meet a majority or a supermajority. Then the NLRB goes to the employer and says, a card check has been performed and has been won. Do you want an election? Right. Instead of the union having to do that work. Right. As well as, once that happens, if the employer decides, okay, yeah, we want to have an election, if the NLRB then finds that union busting activity took place between that point in the election, the NLRB will force the employer to negotiate with the collective bargaining uh, agent. Mm -hmm. No longer will they just get fined or forced to have in another election that they're going to lose because the union busting has already happened. They will be forced to negotiate with the union. Hmm. So this is an incredibly pivotal change, uh, an important change. Very I was not aware yeah. of that update. Yeah. Yep. This I was in the middle of like and surrounded week. by superheroes, so I've completely... <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I mean, it's Labor Day weekend. I mean, yeah. you, don't, you, know, you don't pay attention. Um, but you know, th this is going to make organizing so much easier and so much faster. Can, can, uh, I, can I ask you, I don't want to put you on the spot on, on the details too much, but like, do you know what the exemptions are or like oh what, God. like, because, because that's going to, the, the devil's in the details, but also I'm really excited to engage with yeah. groups that are going to do the education work on this to make yeah. sure that workers know that they now have this right. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, they, they have a little bit more capacity to move in. I think this is very I exciting. Don't, I don't have the finer right. details. My, my best friend's. Right. A uh, girlfriend is the is the director for legislative affairs for the state fed here in Georgia, and she's going right. to kill me for not knowing those details. Uh, but <laughs> it just we won't came tell out, him. and you know you were yeah, surrounded by supervillains and superheroes too. Yeah. All weekend. Uh, but so, I encourage everyone to reach out to either you know a local union that is a, uh, related to your workplace or the, your state's AFL CIO. Uh, you know, a federation uh, to find out those details. They're probably on their website uh, right. or just on the NLRB's website. Right. Um, they, one of the really encouraging things is this administration's NLRB has been very, very focused on fixing what has gone wrong in the past 30 years. Which is a lot. <laughs> it's right. a lot of work. Right. It's right. a lot of work. It and including time. in the tech sector. That's what we've been seeing, right? There's, yeah. There have been, there's been executive orders, but there's also been, um, you know, 
some level of guidance is uh, coming out of the out of the regulators, um, the the, the uh, labor regulators on that question, saying we have to tighten the screws. There's already rules in place that were were not being enforced, um, or there weren't mechanisms for for uh, for workers to to make sure that they were enforced. So that's really good. And I would I would also uh, suggest people think about uh, the tech worker co coalition. If you are uh, in a tech sector, um, there's a great group that's been around for about nine years um, called the Tech Worker Coalitions. They're all local chapters mm -hmm. that are completely autonomous from each other. Sometimes they do political things. Sometimes they are not political at all, and they do just, uh, you know, they, they just do stuff that's workplace. Sometimes they don't do workplace stuff. Um, but different tech worker coalitions in different cities do different, uh, have different focuses and would be uh, uh, really, really a, a great asset to check out, at minimum for, for education on, on some of your labor rights in the workplace and in the tech sector. Yeah. So I'm, yes, I'm a student at Georgia Tech studying computer science. I've like interned in the tech field as a developer, but I've not yet graduated. So, um, so that's my context, I guess. There's sort of, it feels like an impression among maybe especially Georgia Tech students, um, but I think a lot of software developers in general that were like kind of too good for a union or like too good to need one. Like that's right, a, right. that's a them thing. Um, and that's probably not helped by software developers making a lot more money in some cases than the more traditional union jobs we think of. Uh, my dad's an airline pilot, so I don't quite get that. But um, So my question, I guess, is how do we, like, fix that culturally? That's a big question. But Just what a can we do one. to, <laughs> like, fight against that and, I guess, convince people that unions are, like, worth doing and worth finding without sounding like a hippie communist too much? Um, <laughs> I, I'll say one thing. I think, um, you know, where when you're in school, you know, for a lot of these fields, there are professional associations, and the professional associations, in many cases, uh, uh, for example, in, in video effects, they are uh, largely sponsored by the management, and a lot of the people on the boards are management, and so people kind of like, uh, so, so I would say, Think about you know the the campus-based uh, professional associations or professional groups, um, and you know thinking about how uh, basic labor rights and basic collective bargaining uh, conversations should be a thing that they're talking about, right? Right at before people even have the jobs or when they're going into the internships, um, you know people should be feeling a little more entitled to, for example. Uh, in a paid internship rather than unpaid internship um, because when you're doing unpaid labor you're often taking that away from a paid worker um, you know not in all cases certainly but but in many cases and in general right the experience isn't always worth it so or, or uh, in some cases you're doing something that does turn a profit for the management so I think thinking about it in terms of the internships thinking about it in terms of people who are uh, who are going to be going into entry-level positions um, to you know but it's it's all bread and butter struggle. So the question's a little bit like what actually speaks to the to the students um, who are eventually t tomorrow's workers uh, at Georgia Tech, right? Whether it is if it's a question of discrimination, if it is if it's a question of vacation time, um, because you may have a lot of pay, but you may not have a good vacation time, or you may work in a tech sector where they don't give you PTO. They say you have open-ended vacation, and then nobody is everybody's pressured out of taking real vacations. So you know, thinking yeah. about these kinds of things, maybe having some kinds of seminars on 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 burnout because you know young workers or workers who haven't you know uh, joined the workforce may not be thinking about these things but workers who are five years in three years in are and they are burned out in many cases so you know bring them in to, to, to have these kinds of conversations I think that would be a good starting point um, and then you know uh, you'll you'll still have you'll always have people who are professionals or libertarians who just uh, don't want to do it until suddenly it's in their best interest. Um, but at least, you know, kind of germinating the idea is, is I think, helpful. Okay. So uh, I'm a government contractor over here on the uh, East Coast up in the D.C. area. And I have kind of a twofold, I guess, question. Uh, I'm at a point in my career where I'm kind of not quite all the way into the management side, but team lead, you know, sure. so depending on how things are organized, I could fall on either side of of it. Yes. And so my question is kind of, for us contractors, how do we get over the hump of being contractors instead of full employees? And right. if I do fall on the management side of the uh, situation, when, if an organization happens, 
right. how can I support those union folks? Because I'm, I would be fourth generation if I fell into a union. Grand, great granddad was a union organizer. Granddad was right. a union organizer. Right. Dad was a union organizer and, and a uh, union steward. And I may end up on management, but I'm not a class trader. So I want to make sure <laughs> I can help them out. You know, I want to make sure I'm doing the right for the people who are organizing. <laughs> Sorry, I was just looking at me because so I recently got a promotion and I'm no longer I'm I'm no longer in the unit. Um, <laughs> uh, I all, know I uh, was on the organizing committee. I was on the negotiation team until um, until I took that position. Um, so it's a thing I think about a lot. I'm still kind of figuring out that question for myself, right? I mean, I think um, for me it it is uh, just sort of like listening to what you know, listening to what my my, uh, my direct reports are saying and really trying to think about supporting them and figuring out um, ways, uh, you know, and the needs that they have. You know, we're really not supposed to, you know, I'm not supposed to ask them. You're not, you're not supposed to do anything like that. So um, for me, it's just sort of being generally <laughs> supportive um, in, the, in the best and most neutral way that I can um, because I think it can be quite difficult when you're management, but... And promotions are one of, um, I, I, I hear an alarm, and I hope that we can get with that this last question. Um, but uh, the, the, you know, a part of it is also that, you know, promoting people up is a, is a great way to, un to, to bust a union, promoting some leadership up or something else to that effect. And I think one of the questions in some cases, including uh, in, I don't know, in contract negotiations I've heard about, um, is making sure that ma people who are promoted up to management actually are management, right? Because, you know, you could be a team leader who doesn't have hire and fire power, right? And so the question is, what, what really makes you management versus, uh, versus still being in the bargaining unit? There are uh, plenty of, there's always, you know, some level of um, workers who are in a gray area, uh, and, you know, that should be a part of contract negotiations. In some cases, you know, whoever's negotiating the contracts may not you know, people may fall by the wayside, and I, I think that's that sucks, frankly. Um, but I think that, you know, making sure that you're, like, at least kind of advocating for yourself if you don't have real management power. And if you do have real management power, you can still talk up the union, I guess. I mean, just don't talk up the yellow unions. Don't talk up the fake unions. <laughs> um, you know, talk up the, the, the real union in the sector and say, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we have some level of democratic decision making because it makes me a better manager. Oh, I'll, I'll just get you after the session. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, okay. You, we, I mean, we, we'd love to hear it. Okay. We, we can. have time. We have a minute. Oh, so at Georgia Tech, um, they made two hires in the last two years that look like a film professor and look like an interactive media scholar, but we're both labor people. So we invite you to come and speak on our campus. Oh, oh great. Yes, <laughs> oh, we would love to. <laughs> all right. Well, we're at time. Thank you all so much for coming and for sharing your experiences. Please rate the uh, please rate the panel. I don't know if there are any other labor panels, um, and so you know, more. please rate the panel we so we get more next <laughs> next time. Um, there are EFF badge ribbons up here if anybody wants to take some, and then the gentleman from the CWA, I not affiliated with EFF, but has also left some material on the table. And we so. have dice 